it's the last weekend before we get to election day. A lot is going on. A lot has been going on. A lot's going on around here. You know, as we record this week's episode, it's Halloween and quite disturbed by some of what I've seen in the building here today. Quite disturbing. Anyway, uh, John Cuvion with JMC Analytics is here. Quite disturbing. <laughs> and um, we, here we are, the last weekend before we get into Election Day, the big Election Day. Let's start as we did last week. John's also going to be the guest on this week's C-Suite that's going to drop on Monday, the day before Election Day. Let's talk about where we are. Early voting has been stellar across America. How's it been in Louisiana? It's good. And actually, what's kind of interesting is depending on how you spend the statistics, either we broke a record or we came close to breaking a record. And the reason for that difference is, of course, there were mail-in votes which were less than what they were in 2020. Mm. But still, we had a healthy amount of early voting. We fell just short of a million statewide and just short of 100,000 here in East Baton Rouge Parish. In other words, we were very close to the 2020 numbers. So in terms of who was turning out, any insight on, mm -hmm. on that? Yes. So what's happened is that, and I'm seeing this occurring not only in East Baton Rouge Parish, but in the state of Louisiana, but across mm -hmm. the nation as well. Two themes, number one, depressed minority turnout. Number two, turbocharged Republican turnout. Yeah. So here in East Baton Rouge Parish, while we had 5,000 less early voters, the black percentage was 2% less than it was at a similar period of time in 2020, which will have a bearing on the mayor's race. What do you, what do you tri attribute that to, though? I just think that for whatever reasons that Kamala Harris is not exciting the minority contingent. That's just interesting though, but because yeah. you would think because of the, uh, is it a strategic misstep by the Harris campaign or is it something else? The fundamental physics I look at is that unlike 2007 and 8 when Barack Obama was running for president, yeah. the Democrats are the party in power, number one. Number two, they're going to get blamed for everything. Yeah. And in this case, the everything is concerns about the border and about the economy. And so I think those are trumping, pun intended partially, those are trumping any residual allegiance that they may have had to the Democratic Party. Let's switch back and then we'll go, uh, we'll finish with the, the presidential election. Talking about locally here, the mayoral race, and we spoke last week about this. John's going to be back next week again to talk about the results of what happens on Tuesday. Uh, the mayor's ad, as we talked about last week, we've now had more than a week to digest it and what its impact is. How do you think it plays for Mayor Broom? Badly. Badly, do you now? I do, because for the simple reason is that if you're a mayor running for re-election, to me you should be trumpeting your accomplishments as opposed to just low blows like that. And plus, Ted James is not a political novice. He has been around the political block, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So to accuse him of something he's not, I mean, it's kind of interesting. On one hand, you have partisan Republicans who are talking about, oh, well, he was the co-chair of the Kamala Harris campaign, and oh, he had a terrible conservative voting record in the legislature, et cetera, et cetera, to being falsely accused of being a MAGA Republican. You know, there's attacks, and then there's pointless attacks. Well, it was an interesting move, but the, the, the fact that they released the entirety of the conversation, well, there's a lot of it. I hear there's more of it, but there are a, a lot more of that context was released uh, last week and I talked about it. The impact it has on Republican support for Sid Edwards is what? Mixed, because the thing about it is Ted is basically dominating the airwaves, number one. And number two, he does have people closer in town in Baton Rouge, more of what you would call your establishment Republicans, who are carrying his electoral water. And so that, to me, matters a lot more than the fact that his uh, that Sid Edwards yep. may be putting out a mail or two. Yeah, there's a video of him there on the on the screen. Uh, who's if you if you're not involved in high school sports around EBR, this is not someone you have ever heard of. Correct. But if you are, there are a great number of people who know Sid Edwards. Let's switch back to the presidential election now. What a bizarre few weeks we have had. Yes. The and, and just in this week. While Vice President Harris is giving, having a rally, giving a speech, uh, President Biden is conducting a virtual interview with people, which was interesting because he, the White House says it was a gaffe that he called Trump supporters garbage. I don't even know what to make of it. But then you have the former president coming out to a rally wearing an orange vest and then uh, 
getting into a, a garbage truck as he leaves the rally. It's like, are we being pranked? So what's about the, pre tell me about the presidential race. The interesting thing about the presidential race is I think that was an unbelievably foolish gaffe that the Biden campaign made. Because the one thing you never want to do is give your, those not supporting your candidacy a reason to go out and vote against you now. This to me is reminiscent of Mitt Romney's 47% remark in yes, 2012. Yes. Reminiscent of Hillary Clinton calling Trump supporters a basket of deplorables. Yeah. Because basically you, in this case, would be Joe Biden slash Kamala Harris, make yourself the butt end of a joke, especially when the person you're trying to attack has fun with it, which is wearing a garbage vest, driving a garbage truck, and so forth. Because I can all of a sudden imagine T-shirts, you know, garbage men for Trump or garbage people for Trump and so forth. How how quickly could someone get a logo on a garbage truck is that? It was like six hours and there was yeah. a garbage truck with a logo on it. The McDonald's comment was made and literally the next day the dude is handing out fries through a window. They don't miss, a, miss a, an opportunity. So here's the thing on the C-Suite podcast. John's talk strategy. We're going to get into some predictions because this show will run the day before the election. So we'll get his thoughts on how we think things are going to go uh, in on Election Day. One last question before we get out of here. Turn out on Election Day. Do you think it's going to be really good or eh? really good, but somewhat less than what it was before? In other words, I'm thinking a 5% decrease, both 5 in Louisiana decrease. and nationally. Okay. All right. Well, as I said, uh, you know, we're, we're coming up, we're going to talk about uh, the Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month and an organization that's benefiting. <laughs> so, no, you are not on an acid trip. This is actually happening on camera right now. So this is Chuck. <laughs> and this is Chuck. And that is Chuck. I... I walked into this today. Happy Halloween, Clay. I hate you all. <laughs> and Joseph is going to be in the giant. If you see him looking through the window at you in the podcast studio, it just, oh my God. Back in just a moment. So as many of you remember, November is Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month and there are a number of events that happen nationally, but here in Baton Rouge, there is a foundation named after a former member of the media here in our community, uh, the Elvin Howard Senior Pancreatic Cancer Advocacy Fund. I got through that the whole first time without messing it up. Uh, Veronica Howard Sizer is here and she's one of the founders of the organization. and. Uh, Elvin Sr. was your father. Absolutely, and absolutely. Let's talk about why y'all decided to start this foundation. Um, well, the, the thing that uh, struck my family the most was the misdiagnosis. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times you have the, the, the jaundice, the backache, the, the, those types of things, and you say, oh, well, there's nothing to it. You know, I just need to go and take some antacids, mm -hmm. et cetera. And uh, our misdiagnosis of diabetes, which would ha which is what happened with my father, yeah. and so he was misdiagnosed with uh, diabetes prior to his uh, pancreatic cancer diagnosis, and so early detection is the key. I mean that six months that he was dealing with diabetes, he could have been dealing with the pancreatic cancer. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so as everyone knows, pancreatic cancer moves fast. Six it, months is an eternity. It, it is an eternity. What have you, in the work with the foundation, what's the biggest thing you've learned about the work to battle pancreatic cancer? I, I think that the biggest thing that I've learned is that um, the more we put awareness out there, the better it's going to be for our community. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I say community, I don't just mean um, um, Louisiana or uh, Baton Rouge, so to speak. I'm talking about our national community, and that is uh, everyone knows uh, that work in this space and any kind of cancer, any type of those uh, uh, diseases that are out there, that early detection is the difference between, um, can be the difference between life and death. And you see the website for the yeah. foundation there. <clears throat> now this weekend, there is, you have two, two bites at the apple to support the foundation. This weekend, there is the walk slash run. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Yeah, we have our uh, annual f uh, 5K run, mm -hmm. one mile walk, for those of you who don't want to run. <laughs> uh, and is, we're doing it again in conjunction with the city of Baker. I think yeah. that Mayor Waits there has taken this on as a uh, personal crusade for him mm -hmm. as well. And we have a beautiful community there in Baker. And so we will be at the B Baker City Park 
walking and running, uh, sharing information, enjoying DJ Incredibles. DJ uh, Incredible. <laughs> yeah, he will be out there as well. And we're just going to have a good time fellowshipping for a few hours on Saturday morning. And then next Friday on the 8th is the gala and the auction. Let's talk about that. Yeah, we have our annual fundraiser. This is our eighth one, and each year it gets better and better. We're going to have Latangela Faye, mm -hmm. uh, who is going to be uh, hosting the event for us, and of course, George Bell George and friends. Last year we George had him, and we boy. just <laughs> had to have him again. He, he absolutely. So we're looking forward to having a great time raising money right. because this work takes money. It takes money, mm -hmm. and you're you're not only raising money, you're raising awareness absolutely. as well. So tell people where they can go to make a donation, or are there tickets still available for oh, next absolutely. week? Absolutely. So where can they go to get those tickets? Um, you can visit our website. On our website, you have a link. To to our 4 or 5K if you want to sign up to come and join us on Saturday morning or if you would like to uh, come to our uh, fundraiser there's a link there also to sign up on Eventbrite and so we we uh, and if you would like to donate there's yeah. a donate button there too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. look I got less than a minute. Mm -hmm. Where are we in the fight with pancreatic cancer? Now? You know what we are pretty uh, we, we've made strides, I would okay. say that. When we first started this um, this uh, journey eight, nine years ago, mm -hmm. uh, the survival rate for those with pancreatic cancer, five-year survival rate was around, hovering around 7%. We're now mm, around 11 yeah. to 12%, yeah. and that's because of early detection, that's because of awareness. Uh, I, I, we have a board member that always say, you know, um, uh, Mary Bird Perkins started off you know, small. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, the Coleman started off small, but it's organizations like ours that bring attention to the, um, bring attention to these diseases to move the needle forward. This lady is a force and the cause is so, so great. The walks this weekend, walk slash run, and then the galas next week. You saw the website, buy a ticket or make a donation back in just a moment. And you can catch the show every Friday, streaming on the WAFB app, airs on Friday nights at 7 p.m. on BXH or WAFB Plus, and replaying on Saturdays at 3 p.m. in the same place. So you know the value of athletics to young people isn't just teaching them how to bounce or catch a ball, it's also teaching them life skills and keeping them engaged. And in the case of kids in disinvested communities, it gives them something to do when they're not in school. Yeah. Uh, Leroy and Corey are here to talk about Louisiana Sports, Youth Sports Network, and let's talk about that, man, because we were talking during the break about that. Some kids get home and there's nothing there's for nothing them. To do. Yeah. And like when we were coming up, you went and found somewhere to either yeah. play basketball or football <laughs> or baseball. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about the value of having kids engaged in sports. It, it's just, I'm gonna tell you, it's the organized side of sports. Mm -hmm. Just being in sports is because, it, like you said, you're getting out of school, you go and play on a basketball court. Uh, we've heard it over the years. Yeah, there's a shooting because there's somebody with a gun at the, un at the basketball court mm -hmm. or on a football field. But being in the organized sport, when you get out of school, what we try to do is you, you're at school to about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. We get you at 5 o'clock to 7. So 5 to 7 to 8, that's another four hours that we just took you off the street. And mm -hmm. we have young men that are around you, adults that are around you that are talking something positive. So you're getting this information at school that, hey, you need to be a good kid. You need to do better in life. And then now we're getting you and we're reinforcing it. We just took, we just took about, what, 12? 13, 14 hours out of day to yeah. give some positive. Yeah. So now I hope you go to sleep for eight hours right. and, and right. we right. took care of the rest of it. Right. Right. So now hopefully you don't go to sleep and forget what everything you talk, but we try to do it every day to start Well, you again. think about some of the kids who, who move around our city who don't have someone to teach them, especially you know the young men, life skills. Yes. Um, yeah. When you play sports, you need to be at practice on time. It teaches mm -hmm. you how to be punctual, right? Yeah. Well, you have to show up knowing what your what the playbook is, so you have to be organized and pre prepared. Yeah. All these things that will help you later on in life. What's the biggest thing you hope you achieve? Because you've been doing this a long time. But mm -hmm. Biggest thing you hope you achieve in engaging with these kids? That at least they see that they can be something more than what they see in that community. Yeah. A lot of the role models, models in the community are not good role models. Yeah. So seeing that, and, and it's not just from the people that are out in the streets, sometimes it's in the house. Mm -hmm. So we try to show the kids that, hey, there's something different, that I can live in your neighborhood. I, I live in the neighborhood of Scotlandville, mm -hmm. and I'm doing it the positive way. 
I had a kid call me back probably about 10 years ago. He said, Coach, you were the only one I ever saw in my neighborhood that made money the right way. Mm. That's why we do it. So, so, and then it's, it's little things. And Cora tell you yeah. that. I was going to ask you, man, you know, we give up on so many of these kids. Last week I had a group of young ladies in here who are part of a youth advisory council, and I think there's far more of them that can and will do it the right way if we put them in the right environment. Yeah, just being able to, and, and kind of what he's saying, just enforcing them to say, hey, you're a student before you're an athlete, so we want you to, to, to be something better when you're away from us so we can come back and reward you with something else more than that. And just giving them intangibles or tangibles to, to be better people and, and become better people in life. Just like, like Leroy said, you know, they see who we are and we want them to not only maybe be like us but mm -hmm. also become better than us and you come back and give and give to the youth once you get older and, and grow in life. So, Well, Coach, how can people support this if someone wants to donate to what you're doing? And, and Because, I mean, you know, it, it takes money to do yes. everything. You know, so, <laughs> so, so. Take 20 years of it, a, a, a big bar and, 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 and hoping. I mean, God has really blessed us. Yeah. I, I have to say that. And then we have great partnerships uh, with community partners that come in. But we're always looking. There's no donation too small and there's no donation too large that we'll, we'll get in. How can people do so, it? So if it come out to our website, we have a website. Website, Louisiana yep. Youth Sports Network .com. Yeah. And then there, from there, you can actually give to us or whatever you want to give. There's a portion that, that There's you a website on to. the screen there. Yeah. You could you could give to us. Uh, you could call us. Uh, all our contact information. You can always email us, and just come out and help. My biggest yeah. thing is that anytime, and, and we were talking about it in the break. You say you passed by Memorial yeah. Stadium and yeah. stuff. Anytime you see kids at Memorial Stadium and Olympia Stadium on Saturday and Sundays, that's us. Oh, man. So stop by. Come by. Stop by. It's an open to, invitation. It's an open look, invitation. The weather's good to come outside, oh, right? right. <laughs> so so, so this, this weekend is our weekend. So right. it's our homecoming weekend. So, so we bring everybody that's in the program. And, and we were talking. We always have, we probably got about 3,000 kids and about 200 volunteers. And all yeah. of them come out this weekend. Brother, I love it. Congratulations on the work you've been doing for a long time. Appreciate it. Corey. Yeah. Back in just a moment, the C-Suite this week will feature a conversation with John Conroy about next Tuesday's Election Day. Can't wait to get past that. We'll be talking about it on the next episode. He is the superintendent of schools here in East Baton Rouge Parish, Lamont Cole, who has had a long honeymoon period, man. You think? I think so. It's been relatively quiet as it relates to the district. Uh, people are in a good place about what's happening at EBR schools right mm -hmm. now. It's got to make you feel good, man. You know, I don't, I don't know if it makes me feel good more than it makes me feel com confident we're doing the right things. I, right? I would agree um, because you, you saw the headlines and leading up and I, we haven't had any stories like that. No, uh, and that's, it's been intentional that yeah. we settle things down quiet the district and give folks confidence that we are here to support them at our schools and and really spend our time there providing support for teachers providing support for school leaders and staff and making sure we do that and i think that has been our focus thus far instead of making a big splash sure. just really focusing on support let's talk about some of the policy policy changes yeah. that you have employed since becoming soup yeah well one, one of the, the change the big change we made at the board level was to change uh the public comment yes uh process and we just wanted to hear from the public first mm -hmm. and so that the board could have very robust conversations around the issues that are going to impact our students. Uh, the process we had before is that they would have quick conversations and take an action mm -hmm. and then generally the, the community would comment on the action mm -hmm. that was taken and I just felt like it, it created a less of an opportunity for the board to engage in discourse around the item hearing from the community first and then voting. I think the conversation should happen before the action, whereas the process we had is the action took place before the conversation. Yeah. And much of the conversation was not based on the item, it was based on the action. And so for me, I don't think we should have conversations around actions as much as we should have conversations around student and yeah. student outcomes. Yeah. And so we made that. And you know, some people uh, were against it. The majority of the people I know supported it because I always see wise counsel before mm -hmm. making recommendations to our board. It's interesting, man, because the board meetings, quite frankly, have been really emotional and 
confrontational and, and so often I, I don't believe it's in the best interest of the kids right. or the city to have those kinds of displays happening. Obviously you have not had to experience that. How do you avoid that? How do you encourage people to be passionate, be involved, but keep it respectful? Well, I think one, my, my encouragement to everyone is to be harsh on the item and mm -hmm. not the people. Yeah. Be harsh on the item and not each other. Yeah. And I think the process we had lended itself to people being harsh on each other. Yeah. And so I think if we rem operate from that premise, rem change the process so that it is about the item itself, it is about the item that is going to affect children, mm -hmm. I think the conversation changes and it makes it you know, if you have passion, your passion will show itself around the item and not the person who has chose to take one position or another. Yeah, we're wrapping up or getting close to the end of the first half of the year. Got less than a minute. What's your goal for the second half of this school year? To really engage. I did my listening tour with uh, schools. I want to do my listening tour with the community. Okay. And my listening tour is different, not to get to know them, but to understand what you want. Yeah. What is it you want from our school system? What yeah. is it do our families want from our school system? I want to know that in the first quarter of 25. Look, at some point, I got to get you out to the to Howell Park, your old council district that's right. where that's right. the Inspiration Center is coming up out there, yeah, man. Great work. And I'm, I'm looking forward to us partnering with, with the building out there. And, I'd and love for it to be a, a bus stop. I, listen, I told yeah. Angel Nelson with Boys and Girls Clubs that, that you said that, then I, I think we're going to do it. Uh, man, I, look, I've said it to you before on camera, on and off the record, I think the work that's being done at EBR schools is good. Thank you. I'm glad that it seems more candidly adult mm -hmm. and that people are being civil because mm -hmm. the work is important. So we appreciate you. Welcome here anytime, man. Thank you, man. I really would like to come on uh, at least once every other week to talk about the greatness that okay, is in our school system. Uh, we'll, we'll work on that. <laughs>